Hi, this is Val Campbell, and I want to take a few minutes and introduce a, um, a new subject line that I want to spend some time exploring with everybody. And this is a little bit different because normally I'm talking about business things and economic things, and I'm going to kind of shift just a little bit um, because I want to talk about this virus situation and um, what, what does that mean for the world and for our businesses specifically moving forward. And I just want to share with everybody my foundational thought here, okay, the, 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 the bottom line. We are experiencing right now a viral pandemic. This is not unusual. This isn't the first time this has happened. This has happened six times in the last century. The, the most recent was about 10 years ago with H1N1. 1.4 billion people got sick with that. Uh, 500,000 people died. In the United States, it was 65 million people sick, sick and somewhere just under 20,000 people died, maybe, maybe 12 to 15,000. So this is not, having a, having a viral pandemic is not new. In fact, it, with, with HIV, although it was transmitted differently, okay, it wasn't an aerosol transmission, you know, coughing and sneezing, 36 million people died. There's still 40 million people in the world sick with HIV. So, so we've seen pandemics before. That's not unusual. What is remarkably unusual is society's response to this pandemic and how rapid the response was. This is what I'd like to take some time to explore and to think about how is this changing our entire perspective of the world and who we are and how we communicate, okay? Now, let me just kind of line out the process here a little bit or what happened uh, so, that, so that we can kind of get on the same page. Um, there, you know, most of these coronaviruses, first off, there's two different primarily types of viruses that we deal with in pandemics. One is a, one is an influenza virus. That's most typical. The other is a coronavirus. The coronaviruses typically aren't, they don't break out quite as much. They're, they, they make people pretty violently ill, more, typically more violently ill than the, the influenza. The, the thing about the coronaviruses is that they are a viral pneumonia. That's, that's the, the, it just instant pneumonia and, and really intense. And you know, corona, coronas, uh, you know, violent coronas have been around for a long time. In fact, the common cold is a coronavirus. And there are others. There's about seven or eight others, okay? So what's, what happened here, of course, was uh, uh, we had a viral outbreak uh, in China. The Chinese tried to suppress that information. It got out into the world. And because of the rapidity, uh, or, I'm sorry, the, the rapid nature of movement, and how mobile the world is today, that virus very quickly was spread into many, many countries. Now, that all happened within such a short period of time, basically about six weeks, roughly. And from that point, it was the response globally was, is remarkable. This is this is, I, I, I watch this, and of course, there's a lot of people stepping back saying, well, why didn't the president do more? And what are we doing? And not, how come there are not enough beds? And how come there are not enough respirators? And how come we don't have enough masks? And I'm, I, I honestly, those responses, quite frankly, are so stupid, I'm sorry, just, just ridiculous, that it's almost more than I can stomach to just listen to that stuff. Think about what happened here just in the United States. Now this happened globally, but let's just talk about just the United States. Within a matter of days, not months, days, a population of 330 million people was mobilized to uh, socially distance, stay home, businesses shut down, people laid off. Uh, you know, the, the response was so rapid. I, 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 I was just shocked. And the speed with which medicines were being experimented with and information was being shared between the French and the Japanese, the United States, and everybody globally was jumped on this thing and they're trying different drugs and, and there are actually vaccines, from what I'm reading, being tested right now 
because within hours, a couple of days of this outbreak, the genome of this coronavirus was identified and shared. I mean, th this is remarkable. These are things that might have taken two years before. But we were on this thing within days, and it allowed society to make a different kind of decision. H1N1, just 10 years ago, was allowed to run rampant through the world because he really didn't have any option. It just wasn't something you just couldn't get ahead of it. You see, the idea here, of course, everybody knows, because everybody's talking about this on social media, the idea here is rather than having a steep curve to flatten that curve, and that lowers the pressure on the hospitals and the healthcare system. And still, we've got all of these people screaming and yelling and pointing fingers at the president or whoever and saying, how come you don't have more masks? And what are you doing to do this? And how come you're doing this? And, well, how come you said this and it's really this? Can you imagine how difficult it is with all of the government agencies and the industries and everything involved in this and a Congress that can't, you know, they can't agree on what's, what color a stop sign is, for crying out loud. But within days, a population of 330 million people was mobilized, a task force was assembled, people are attacking this problem, making decisions. Of course, there's going to be chaos. Of course, there's going to be things that get messed up. Are you kidding me? It's, it's, it's remarkable. Just try and organize a Boy Scout troop sometime, right? You get my point? 330 million people mobilized. That's just one nation, as well as interacting with, with 200 plus nations around the world in discussing things and sharing information. It's remarkable. This allows us, right or wrong, you can argue, you can argue the pros and cons, but we've, we've mobilized to prevent the accelerated spread of a very, very contagious virus. Now, we've made a conscious decision. Again, right or wrong, you can debate things about this, but we made a decision that rather than just infecting 1.4 billion people, we're going to try and lower that. We're going to try and suppress that by shutting things down, social distancing, trying to avoid the transmission rate. And I, just, I think that that's remarkable, just from an intellectual standpoint. But I do want to explore what does this mean going forward, because now we've seen something that, that has never happened before in history. There's never, ever been a time in history where the entire world was instantly mobilized, instantly being really a, a matter of days, weeks maybe, but certainly not months or years, and the economy, in essence, shut down voluntarily. See, you can say that the stock market crash in 1929 you know, basically did something similar, but it wasn't voluntary. People didn't say, you know what, we're all going to stay home. We've never, we've never been down this road. Humanity's never been in this situation before, certainly not on a global scale. So now going forward, we're going to have to figure out how we're going to deal with that. Because as I pointed out the other day, you know, the law of un unintended consequences is not kind. There's a, a reaction for every action. And we are going to see some issues. There are going to be some people die as a result of the steps we took to limit the deaths on one side. You'll see people die and suffer on the other side. So this is going to be very, very interesting. But what I would really like to focus on is this element of going forward. How is this going to change? What I'm kind of describing to everybody is for the last 20 years, we have been involved in what we call a megatrend. This is a a, a, a massive change in the way society operates. But now I believe that that mega trend is going to be pushed into a paradigm shift, which is a, a difference in the way we view our world. And one of those, there's probably a number of these, and I'm going to explore these in, in uh, uh, some of these further discussions across the next few days. But one of those is going to be that people have seen that within a matter of days, almost hours, entire industries can be shut down and people out of work. How, how, how we deal with that with society? Does the government just print money and send it to you? Um, 
What do you do about the disruption? What do you do about the businesses that collapse? Some of those jobs aren't going to exist anymore, right? In the restaurant industry, those, some of those companies aren't going to survive. The construction industry, perhaps, some of those companies aren't going to survive. They're just going to, you know, I just got to close it down. I can't, I can't keep going. What are you going to do about that? Um, the, one of the real casualties of this situation, I believe, is going to be the confidence in employment as a means of income production. I think people are going to look at this and say, wow, that, that, got, that got disrupted way too fast. And, and the government, you know, this is a $20 trillion economy in the United States. The government can't fix that by just sending everybody $1,000 or $1,200 as the, as the case might be what they're talking about. That's not going to fix a $20 trillion you know, economy that just collapsed by a third in a matter of about a week. So I, I think that's going to be one casualty. I think we're going to see some changes in, in some tremendous political pressure and economic pressure on China. Uh, the way that that was handled over there is a function of that style of government. One of the subjects that I want to explore with everybody is that there were, there were a couple of nations that were hit really hard with this. And one of the reasons they were hit hard is because of socialism. And what's the ramification and effect of that? Because that's something that could have been anticipated. One of the things I want to explore with everybody is that uh, in this process of this conversation, we've seen people pointing fingers. In fact, I saw something that the, the Huffington Post, pardon me for swearing, uh, put out this morning it was supposedly from some doctor. Now you never know who's publishing this stuff, right? Or who's writing these articles, but it was supposedly a doctor who was being extremely critical of the administration for uh, the fact that, gee, we don't have enough masks and we don't have enough this, we don't have enough that. Well, we just had a pandemic 10 years ago that, that made 1.4 billion people sick. If, if, if you were so brilliant and you thought that this was something that should have been, why don't all the hospitals have set aside and stocked up a huge supply of masks? This is, this is not the first pandemic. This isn't going to be last. There's going to be some more here coming up. And the reason I say that is because people are traveling and they're more mobile than ever before. And so if something breaks out, it just moves so fast. If there's an incubation period, if there's a period where people can transmit, but they're asymptomatic, it'll get around the world and snap at your fingers. So there's going to be more of these. Now, I do think that we're going to see, a, again, paradigm shift. We're going to see a look at this and say, wow, we need to deal with this way differently. Hospitals, things like that are going to have stores of supplies and equipment. But one of the reasons why we don't have enough respirators or hospital beds, for instance, is because state governments limit how many of these hospitals can put in. These are limited. So, you know, there's just a lot of topics to discuss. I'm kind of intellectually stimulated by that stuff. And I hope that you find some of this interesting, but let's, uh, let's break this off. And um, I'm going to spend some time writing about this and then let's have some fun, fun exploring some of these different things. But one of the things that I want to pass out to my team and to, to the people I'm talking to is we know how to help people make money from home. That's what we do. That's the business we're in. And more, you know, that was a mega trend before. I think it's a paradigm shift now. I think a lot of people are going to be looking for, how do I make money from home? Because one, I'm going to spend a lot of time at home. Two, I'm going to need to make up ground that I lost economically. I'm going to take a hit financially and the stock market's collapsed. Uh, my retirement funds are down. How am I going to catch up to that? What am I going to do about that? We've got the answer. We have the perfect answer, in my opinion, the perfect answer for that situation. So let's get out and share it with people, okay? That's all for now. Talk to you later.